joining with audiences from across the globe to enjoy Harrogate International Festival's series of online events streamed straight from our home to yours. Sit back, relax and enjoy an interview with Ian Rankin as part of the Theakston Old Peculiar Crime Writing Festival sponsored by HQ. We promise you've got the best seats in the house. Good morning, everybody. My name is NJ Cooper, and to, this morning it's my great delight to be asking questions of Ian Rankin. Good morning, Ian. Morning. This is your year at Harrogate, chairing the festival, chairing the programming committee, and a very peculiar year it's being, with no great Theakston's beer, no parties in the garden. What are you going to miss most? Um... Yes, probably the uh, beer in the garden, um, <laughs> because if you, it's one of these things, you, I often arrive, I usually get the train, and then I walk from the station, and I've got my backpack on, and I walk up the driveway to the hotel, and you don't even make it as far as the front door, you'll know this, um, because there are about a dozen people standing out there you've not seen for almost a year, most of them crime fiction writers, but some of them fans, old friends, people in publishing, agents. It can take you an hour or two to actually get to the reception desk and actually get checked in. And by then, you've usually had a few drinks. So it's a lovely way to start a festival. I mean, one it of my is... favourite memories was when uh, it was Willie McIlvany, the Scottish crime writer, alas, no longer with us. And he had written three crime novels in the late 70s, early 80s, and then they'd been out of print for a long time. And they came back into print, and I was due to interview him on stage at Harrogate. And it was a Sunday morning, I think, around about 10, 11 a.m., we're in the green room and he said, nobody's going to come to this. Nobody's going to be up and about at this time in the morning to see me. And we walked into the ballroom, which was full to capacity and beyond. And I could just see the kind of, it just gave him a lift. It gave him a real lift to know that people had not forgotten him or his books in the preceding couple of decades. It is the wonderful thing about Harrogate. Like most crime writers, I've been to lots of festivals where there are two and a half people in the audience. <laughs> and it's quite, quite different to see the whole ballroom. But going back to your career, it's very many years since you told me you thought writers tended to have about a decade at the top. You have had at least double that. And I wanted to ask... What do you think it is about your imagination, your Edinburgh, Siobhan, Rebus, Fox, that speaks to so many people? Uh, I, you know, I don't, I've never really analysed it, Natasha. I think if I analysed it, it might scare me or I wouldn't be able to write any more books. It's something, maybe it's something about the sense of place, which I think all good crime fiction does. It's got a fantastic sense of place. Um, using Edinburgh as a microcosm for things that are happening all around us, whether it's politics, uh, changes in society. Um, it's using crime fiction to ask big questions about good and evil um, and morality. The fact that Rebus is a complicated character, and that's what keeps bringing me back to him, is that I've, with each book I learn a little bit more about him, but also with each book he has changed. He's got older, he's got health issues now, that were not an issue back in the early days of the series. So when I sit down to write a book, it's almost as if I'm writing a standalone because the things have happened to the characters in their lives. Life has moved on. And so it keeps me on my toes. It keeps the series fresh. The thing about a long running series is, you know, the author can get a bit bored. And sometimes as a reader, you can see that. You can physically see the author getting bored of their characters, getting bored of the same setting. There's only so much you can do. But Edinburgh keeps changing, Scotland keeps changing, the world around us keeps changing, and my characters keep changing. So I've never felt that, I've never felt that boredom. Mm. Well, Agatha Christie famously wanted to kill Poirot, didn't she? Um, you could have killed Rebus often, but you've managed to avoid the temptation. I was rereading Black and Blue and was struck by the things that have changed, cigarette <laughs> smoke in pubs, Rebus queuing in the rain for a phone box, and yet the fundamentals are the same. Organized crime, drugs, deprivation, poverty, violence. Violence at home as much, really, as outside. These hard men whacking their wives, 
going out again and whacking the people that Cafferty has told them to whack or Tommy Telford or whoever. Do you think as a society there is any chance of getting better? Um, oh, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, I think crime is, is ever present because the nature of the society we have constructed means there are winners and losers. And the, the, a lot of crime comes back down to the seven deadly sins. Um, and so in some ways, crime fiction is telling a very old story, but telling it in different ways. What does change is, of course, the technology changes. It's, it's much harder these days to have a bent cop, I think, because bent cops get away with it less often than they used to because everybody carries a phone that has a recording function. So you, and everywhere you go, the CCTV and the crime novel has to take that on board unless you're writing golden age crime fiction where you still have old telephone boxes. Um, I've been rereading Laidlaw recently, Willie McIlvany's book, mm -hmm. and his character never drives anywhere. He takes the bus. Uh, and, you know, the notion of a cop taking the bus now is anathema. I, would think to, I can't think of many contemporary writers who would find that a realistic way of getting their detective around the landscape. Um, so the technology changes a way of dealing with crime changes. The crimes themselves you know, crimes of passion are still with us. Greed is still with us. Envy is still with us. Anger um, is all around us. And at the moment, uh, we seem to be living in a very angry period of history and a very polarized period in history where you've got to be on one side or another. You can't sit on the fence. You're not allowed to have a nuanced discussion. You have to have an immediate knee-jerk reaction and then you gather around you all your friends as a kind of fence between you and the people you don't agree with. And crime fiction, I hope, is more complex than that. It's, it doesn't give us a very simple story. It gives us a complex story about maybe fairly straightforward issues. Good and evil are very straightforward concepts on the surface. But once you delve down a little bit, you'll find there are lots and lots of nuances there. And all the different writers I enjoy reading are writers who take that on board, who take on board that there are very complex reasons for crime to exist, even though the crimes themselves may not have changed very much over millennia. That rather preempts my next question, because I was watching your film lit with Brian Cox as Rebus, and that Rebus says, <laughs> you know, you no longer have to choose between the Beatles and the Stones. You, these days, you can be who you want to be. And I was going to say, in these days of woke, can we really be who we want to be? I, I mean, Rebus is a certain age, let's not forget. He's, an, he's, a, he's a good decade older than me, or almost a decade older than me. And um, My age, very, therefore. Yeah, no, 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 let's not go there, Natasha. And um, he's got a very different view of the world. Um, and sitting in his, uh, his flat in Edinburgh in a tenement, of course, he's got a very different view of the world from a lot of other, other people who don't live in that situation and don't live with the situation he's got. Um, I mean, he's thinking back to the Beatles and the Stones. He's thinking back to the Mods and the Rockers and the fact that these days it seems to be much more of a melting pot. Um, and yeah, maybe if you're looking from the outside, you go, no, no, these binaries are still with us. Um, but uh, in terms of music, you know, I mean, uh, my, the music I listen to, I listen to all kinds of music from classical and jazz to hard rock to reggae, you name it. Um, whereas Rebus is, kind of, is a bit stuck himself. He's the kind of guy who only listens to the Stones and never listens to the Beatles. Um, right. and, uh, and so he's, yeah, he's, got a, he's actually got a very binary way of looking at the world, now that I think about it. I mean, he does see the world in terms of absolutes, absolute good and absolute evil. Um, which is why I have other characters such as Siobhan Clark try and explain to him that there are nuances there and people are allowed to change and just because you've committed a crime doesn't mean to say you're a criminal for the rest of your life. And oftentimes because I'm a much more liberal um, in my politics, much more liberal than Rebus is, I've got to have that argument with him that the, that the world is much more nuanced than he sees it. And yet it's rather interesting because although he's tortured by guilt about all sorts of things, he does rather see himself as the only truly virtuous man around, doesn't he? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think he, he sees himself as being on the side of the angels, um, but always being tempted. I mean, the whole raison d'etre of Cafferty, the gangster who in the later books controls Edinburgh, is for him to be the devil, is for him to keep tempting Rebus into breaking the rules just that bit too far and not crossing back over the line to be one of the good guys again. 
Um, so that relationship has, has, has changed during the course of the books as well. Um, is he a good man or is he not? I mean, I think uh, he's, he represents the kind of fictional cop. And in fact, it used to be the fictional private eye that we used to see a lot of um, who kind of makes his own rules. He's almost like an existential hero, which is why a lot of American crime fiction was taken seriously in France when it wasn't taken seriously anywhere else was that the French, the philosophical French, so the detective, the private detective, is someone who creates their own set of rules and values and lives by those. Um, and Rebus has always done that. He always in the books has operated almost as a private eye within the police, going off and doing his own thing, breaking the rules, sidestepping the rules, being a maverick, running his own investigation, not working well as part of a team. He wouldn't last two minutes in the modern uh, British police force because of that. Um, but he operates quite well as a private detective, and I've always had a soft spot for American private eye stories. Um, one of my big heroes is Lawrence Block, um, mm -hmm. who writes the Matt Scudder, although he says he's written his last Matt Scudder novel. And very early on in my career as a crime writer, um, before it was my full-time job, uh, I came across the Matt Scudder novels, and Cafferty was invented as a nod to one of the characters uh, in the Scudder series, a guy called Mick Ballou, who's a New York gangster who the private detective Matt Scudder becomes quite friendly with. And so that was the relationship that built up between Rebus and Cafferty was a homage or theft uh, of some of the ideas in Larry Block's books. This is one of the things I love about crime fiction. There is an inheritance and people do take up characters. I'm thinking here of Mick Heron and um, Jackson Lamb and Mick's devotion to Reg Hill's novels. He never met Reg, but we do, we love our colleagues' work and we, as you say, it's homage or borrowings or developing the themes. Yeah, and sometimes it's a reaction. I mean, when you're a young, angry crime writer, um, there were a few of us around in the 80s, and we decided we wanted to kick against the English tradition, the cosy as it was known in America. Um, we wanted to write something that was more determinedly urban um, and perhaps slightly more nihilistic or anarchic. Um, and there was a kind of movement where we thought, right, the way to do this is to shock the reader out of their complacency by bringing in lots of... Uh, Grand Guignol serial killers. We had read um, Thomas Harris and we wanted to do our own kind of take on the, the serial killer, almost as mythical or fairy tale monster. Um, and, then, and then, you know, most of us grew up and we decided that, <laughs> this, uh, that in fact there's a place for nuance in the crime novel. You don't have to shock. I remember quite early on, it was the third Rebus novel, uh, Tooth and Nail, which was set in London. I was living in London at the time and didn't like it. So I thought I'll bring Rebus to London so he can not like it as well. And that in thrall to Thomas Harris, I had this very Grand Guignol serial killer and it had scenes of sex, scenes of a sexual nature and very Shocking. graphic descriptions, I know. And my editor at the time, God bless him, a very old fashioned traditional publisher, uh, Ewan Cameron, who's still around and has just written his first novel, I think at the age of mm. 80. Uh, his first novel, Madeline, uh, which is a good old-fashioned traditional novel. He said to me, look, can we just, A, can we pause at the bedroom door, please? And can we not have as much description of the violence? Please allow the reader to use their imagination. They will dream up many more scenarios than you can. And so I learned a valuable lesson, which is that crime fiction doesn't need uh, to have sex and doesn't need to have violence necessarily. And luckily with a cop, the cop turns up after the act of violence has taken place. So what Rebus and Siobhan Clark and my other characters are doing is dealing with the aftermath rather than the, uh, the violent act itself. So that allowed me a, a certain, I could relax then because I'd really felt, you know, queasy writing mm -hmm. about violence or writing, you no, know, describing violence. Um, and also describing sex, lordy lordy. I was very glad to stop at the bedroom door whenever Rebus went inside with a lady. Well, it's one of those weird things, isn't it? Nobody thinks that we have committed all the crimes in our novels, but everybody thinks we've had all the sex. <laughs> Moving on to something slightly more serious, it occurs to me that crime novels, good, sensible crime novels, are also social history. And you have covered a lot of important things in Scottish history as they happen. Did you set out to do that? I set out to write about 
Edinburgh to try and make sense of Edinburgh to me and using Edinburgh as a character. I think I was, again, I'd been studying the Scottish novel and had fallen in love with the prime of Miss Jean Brodie mm. and Jekyll and Hyde and had seen the influence of Jekyll and Hyde on Miss Jean Brodie to a certain extent. Um, but nobody seemed to be writing about contemporary Edinburgh in the 80s. And I thought, well, maybe I should do it. There were lots of novels being written in Glasgow, um, but not many novels or any novels that I could find being written about contemporary Edinburgh. And I thought a cop, a detective, is a good way to explore the city. Then I realised fairly early on in the process that Edinburgh could be used as a microcosm for Scotland as a whole, for things that were happening in politics and in society. Um, and when change came, because I was writing about a real place in real time, when change came, that change had to be reflected in the book. So the coming of the Scottish Parliament, the meeting of the G8 in Edinburgh, um, all of these things, uh, the independence debate, of course, Brexit. You, you can't really write a contemporary novel without at least referencing Brexit at some point, although I do it very fleetingly in the last couple of books. Um, I think the only thing I say is that my gangsters are all for it because they are disaster capitalists and they see money to be made from chaos. Um, so, yeah, I guess by accident, the books did become uh, critiques of society or looking at things that were happening around me to try and make sense of them, Natasha. Mm. And it's one of these things where you can't really do it with, 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 with um, countries that have been in complete turmoil. You tend to find if a country has been in complete violent turmoil, let's take Northern Ireland for a, a recent example, the crime fiction only really emerges afterwards yes. to explain or to try and explain what just happened. So you don't need crime fiction in places that are uh, undergoing uh, huge amounts of violence, except you do get it in America. Um, but it comes afterwards as a way of explaining. So the crime novel tends to be a historical novel. It's talking about things that happened five or 10 years ago, rather than things that are happening in here and now, which is why I hope to God, we're not going to get too many COVID crime novels. Oh, Tempting as it very is. Very boring, yes. Your mention of your gangsters as capitalists brings me on to another question I had. I've been rereading <clears throat> your books and obviously haven't reread the whole lot. Me neither. But I can't think of any successful businessman who is also a virtuous man in your fiction. <laughs> Do you think it's possible to be a virtual, virtuous capitalist? Of course. Um, there are plenty of them in Edinburgh. There are plenty of people doing good things with their money. They're all over the place. People who've built up fortunes and then uh, give lots of it to, to mm. charity while still holding on to enough to feel comfortable. Um, there's a, there's a, a, an enterprise here called Social Bites. Social Bites is a kind of sandwich shop where you go and get sandwich and soup at lunchtime. But not only does it employ the homeless, it, it feeds and, and homes the homeless. And the guy behind that has built a kind of mini village on the outskirts of Edinburgh where homeless people can go and live. That um, so that's an extraordinary uh, example of capitalism at work. You could say J.K. Rowling, who's mm -hmm. given hundreds of millions of pounds to, to charitable endeavours, uh, is a good example of that. Um, so, yeah, there are plenty of them. Uh, the, good, uh, the thing about crime fiction is it's not about the goodies, is it, really? We do need our baddies as well. The, uh, goodies are boring. You must have noticed that in, in writing. You know, the, the kind of virtuous people um, are, are kind of not interesting to write about. You know, it's, it's, whenever, you, whenever I go to um, Julie Cooper's novels, to go off at a slight tangent, it's always the cad that I'm interested oh, in. Oh, come on. What about Taggy? It, well, yeah, I know, but she's a bit grey, isn't she? She's a bit bland and a bit, she's a bit of a snowflake. I mean, you, you've got to go for Rupert Campbell Black any day of the week. I mean, he, you know, he's the hero of those stories. And you can tell, you can tell that Julie Cooper uh, finds him a much more interesting character to write about than some of the goody two-shoes that she writes about in her books. Right. And it's the, same, it's the same with police. You know, bent cops are much more interesting to write about or cops that might be able to be bent. Uh, are much more uh, much more interesting than people who go home of an evening to their family and sit and watch telly. And it's why I decided early on that Rebus would not really have a family life because family life just gets in the way of the storytelling. Um, um, you know, I'm sorry, I would love to help you solve the serial killer crime, but I've got a holiday. Uh, I've got to go with my kids, or I've got to take the kids to the dentist. Or, you know, I've got to go home for dinner. Uh, sorry, uh, you know, I can't hang out 24-7 solving this crime. I've actually got a home life. Now, in the real world, most cops do have a fairly successful home life these days. Wasn't always the case. Um, but 
in fiction, I mean, they do exist, you know, I mean, they do exist. Um, uh, is it the Br Brunetti novels? I mean, that's quite a successful... Do I mean Brunetti, Brunetti? I'm getting mixed up here. Uh, Donna Leon's character. Uh, um, living, living Brunetti. In, Brunetti, yeah. Living in Venice uh, with a, a lovely, lovely... Paola. At mm. home, uh, cooking fantastic food, etc., mm -hmm. etc. But those are rare cases. I guess Ruth Rendell did it, didn't she? Um, I mean, to a certain extent. Um, she had a, a, you know, a detective who had a fairly, fairly calm and quiet home life, although his family did get involved in some of his later cases. Uh, but I still, I enjoy the mavericks and I enjoy the people that have just got a bit of edge to them. I, I did notice in, again, in black and blue, when um, Rebus is talking to D Jill Templer, you say Rebus felt comfortable sharing everything but close proximity. <laughs> now, I wondered if that's his fatal flaw or the basis for his superhuman detective talent. If he can't allow close proximity, maybe it wasn't the job that ruined his marriage, but the job that gave him an excuse to have a ruined marriage. What do you think? Uh, again, I think it's probably very complicated and I've not thought about it too much consciously, probably subconsciously, I'm working on it all the time. Um, when I started writing the Rebus books, the cops I met tended to be, to have a kind of broken marriage behind them. They tended to spend too much time in the pub with their colleagues. They had this very, you know, their work patterns, they would be working, you know, long hours, weekends, etc., etc., on a big case, which was detrimental to family life. Now, whether they were unsuited to family life in the first place and this gave him an excuse not to get involved or whether the family life thing fell apart because they were married to the job I'm not 100% sure I know it doesn't happen so much these days the cops I tend to come across these days um, are, are in successful relationships the bulk of them are in successful relationships I just chose to have a series of loners Malcolm Fox is a loner he's got a busted marriage Rebus has a busted marriage Siobhan Clark has never married so they can focus on each other and focus on the case and not have not have all that family stuff getting in the way um, whether it's to do with their character or whether the whether the job has changed them or whether they chose the job because it meant they could act that way I'm not 100% sure I mean, Rebus, I think, is all, grew up on a maverick. He grew up an outsider. He joined the army but didn't fit in and eventually left. He joined the police. He should never have joined the police because he doesn't work well in a team, as I've said. So he's been a misfit all his life. And misfits don't do too well in organisations in general and certainly wouldn't do well in the police these days. Um, which brings me to another question. Somebody once said that writing a novel is like stripping off all your clothes and walking naked down Piccadilly. How much of you is in your novels? I mean, clearly your liking for the Oxford bar and your music, but how much of the more philosophical stuff is you? Well, where do our characters come from? I mean, uh, if Rebus is part of me, so too is Cafferty, so too is Siobhan Clark. I mean, weirdly, I live in um, a, a sort of modern development of high rises where Cafferty also lives. Previous to that, Cafferty lived in the street I had lived in before I moved here. So, and Rebus lives in the street I lived in when I was an impoverished student. So I followed my characters around Edinburgh, really. Um, and how much of Rebus is me? I don't know. I mean, I guess he can be my Mr. Hyde. He gets to say things I couldn't uh, without getting in trouble. Um, he's always got a good one-liner. He's much less liberal than I am. He's much more, I guess... Um, of an anarchist, but also more conservative with a small C, uh, because police officers tend to be that way. They, and he fears change. I mean, he is reluctant to face up to change in society or in the way the police operate or anything else. So younger characters like Siobhan Clark have to represent uh, the willingness to go along with change. Um, so, yeah, and I'm getting older. I mean, I'm getting creaky. So in some ways, physically, I'm getting more like Rebus all the time. And now that he's cut back on the drinking and he's cut out the smoking because he's got COPD, he really is getting more like me all the time. I mean, my God, the Oxford Bar. I've not been in the Oxford Bar since lockdown, which didn't stop me going there on my 60th birthday in April to drink a pint outside. I think um, I saw something on Twitter about that. <laughs> I took a pint glass and a can of beer and I drank it outside the locked bar and then walked home again. That was my daily exercise regime. Um, so, and you know, I, I, 
in some ways, yeah, the music and, and the being a bit of a loner. I mean, I think writers, you know, what are we? We're, we were sometimes the odd kids at school, the quiet kids at school, very self-contained dreamers. We like nothing better than to be in a quiet room with our thoughts. So we'd be sitting at home in our bedrooms, scribbling down poems and song lyrics, drawing pictures, fantasizing, having a very inner creative life. And we never gave that up in a way. I'm still, you know, the lockdown hasn't affected me as much as it has many other people because sitting alone in a room with a, a laptop and my thoughts and my ideas and hopefully my creativity is pretty much all I ever do. Then weirdly, there's that, you know, Jekyll and Hyde thing because now the role of the author is to then go out into the world once you've written a book and sell it door to door uh, like a traveling salesperson. And that aspect has gone We've now got Zoom uh, festivals and online festivals and things. Uh, and because writers, you know, I mean, every time I go on tour, it takes me away from the work. I cannot write while I'm on the road. I cannot even get ideas when I'm on the road. I'm just on the road. So I can't imagine thing. how anybody could because yeah. you're, you're putting out when you're on the road. You're not... You're well, taking... Sandy McCall Smith, Alexander McCall Smith writes everywhere. He writes when he's on tour. He writes when he's on holiday. He writes on trains. He writes on airplanes. He goes on a long flight. He comes out with a novel. You know what I mean? Um, and I know other writers who, I know a few writers who can do that. I can't. No, when I'm on the road, that's it. That's me. I'm on the road. You get back to the hotel. You just flake out. You watch some late night TV. You read the minibar and you go to sleep. And then next morning you're up at 6 a.m. to get a taxi to the airport for the next stop or whatever. So that is exhausting. And, and the, the beauty of this lockdown for the writer is that, you know, if, if you can focus, there's a lot more time to get stuff done. And I finished the latest Rebus book. I finished writing it under lockdown. I edited it, proofread it. Um, I've written that little play for the National Theatre of Scotland about how Rebus would cope in lockdown. I wrote that during the lockdown. I've written introductions to other people's books, a book about the NHS. It's just come out. People write love letters to the NHS. And I wrote a piece for that. Um, I've been getting a lot done and people are spitting now. People watching us are spitting, going, I can't focus. And what I have found hard, I don't know, Natasha, about you, reading. I found it difficult to read and I've actually gone back to reading old favourites, hence reading Laidlaw. I reread mm. A Dance to the Music of Time by Anthony Paul, all 12 volumes. It's been a few years since I read that. Comfort reads. I may pluck a Jilly Cooper or a Muriel Spark off the shelf next. I've got one behind me, along with one of yours. <laughs> um, watching the, the film, the Brian Cox film with Rebus, I wondered a lot about his understanding that a prison cell or life under COVID means you can no longer hide from yourself. So reverting to an earlier question in our last three minutes, have you used your novels as hiding places or as reordering your world as you would like it to be? Again, I think probably a bit of both. I think it's, it's, a, it's a complicated question and probably quite a complex answer. Um, yes, I get to hide behind Rebus. I get to hide behind all the characters. Um, I'm not writing about me on the surface, but underneath, I mean, there was a book and I forget which one it was. It was a fairly re recent Rebus novel. And it has lots of um, parent and child relationships in it or, or quasi relationships, mostly fathers and sons or surrogate fathers and surrogate sons, old gangsters and young gangsters, etc., etc. And a friend of mine said, that's a book about your kids leaving home. That's mm. a book where you are trying to deal with your thoughts about both your sons having grown up and left the nest and suddenly it's just you and your wife who are left. Um, now, on the surface, I think people would not see that. They would read that book and not see that. And while I was writing that, I don't think I was consciously aware of that. Um, but a friend, once they pointed it out, I went, you're probably right. Subconsciously, that was my way of ordering my world or asking questions of mm -hmm. myself by giving the issue or the problem to my characters. And so I think there's a lot of that going on. I mean, famously, I've said it many times, but my youngest son, who's quite seriously disabled, when I found out he was going to be disabled uh, for the rest of his life, I had Rebus's daughter be in a car. Uh, she sat by a car and put in a wheelchair. And that was my way of dealing with the fact that my son was probably never going to walk. It was just, okay, Rebus, you deal with this. Let's see how, maybe I can work out how to deal with it by giving it to you as a problem. And then later on, I felt a bit bad, a bit, a bit guilty about giving Rebus this extra problem in his life. So his daughter did come good. And the next book, which comes out in October, um, is mostly about Rebus and his daughter reconnecting. 
So it's not actually set in Edinburgh mostly, it's mostly set way up on the north coast of Scotland where she lives and takes me and Rebus way out of our comfort zones. And it's no bad thing to do that. I've got I to say very quickly, it's not Rebus goes on holiday because whenever a character, a, a long running character in a series goes on holiday and finds a murder, you go, that's an author who's getting a little bit tired of their character. Or alternatively, an author who wants to go to the West Indies in the winter on the tax map. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much indeed, Ian Rankin, for sharing your thoughts about your work, your life and Scotland. That was great. Thank, thank you. you for, thank you for allowing me into your interview room. Am I allowed to go now? Do I need I a lawyer? I think you're allowed to go. <laughs> Cheers, Bye. Natasha. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us. If you have enjoyed this event as part of the Harrogate International Festivals, please do think about a donation to ensure that our festivals can survive in the future. Donations can be made by texting HIF and the amount to 70085. For more events, please visit our online hub, The HIF Player. It's packed with upcoming live streams, events you've missed, archive recordings and much more.